just not scary at all. Thank you. Like a ghost from the Thank haunted you. mansion. Hello, and welcome to Crush the Podcast, brought to you by the Believe Podcast Network. I'm Kirsten Lyons, and I'm joined today by my cousin and co-host, Aaron Vaderstorff. Um, That's me. Okay, that is you. Um, okay, today's episode is, it's incredible. Like I am oh, so good. I mean, I I'm still in the middle of editing and I don't know how much I'm going to actually have to delete in terms of how many times I gush to Marcy that she's on our podcast. About I'm how like, excited you are to have her. <laughs> or I think I messaged her on Instagram and I was like, hey, um, so I want to wait till we had a second season because she's like so amazing. Now you can like refer back to our first season. But would you um maybe uh, uh like to go to the homecoming dance with me? I mean, that's what it felt like. And she <laughs> was like, and she was like, yeah. And I, I think I just stared at her message back for like three minutes. I was like, what? Um, Aaron, I sent you a link today for a story. Would you mind just reading the title first? I can use my newscaster voice. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know you had one. This is exciting. Okay. It's not that good. I could, I could do it more if I had practice, but <laughs> Turkey, a missing man in Turkey accidentally joined his own search party for hours before realizing he was the person <laughs> they were looking for local media reports. So to summarize, it sounds like, um, this gentleman had been drinking with friends on Tuesday when he wandered into a forest in the Bursa province. When he failed to return, his wife and friends alerted local authorities and a search party was sent out. Um, the man, uh, then stumbled across the search party and decided to join them. But when members of the search party began calling out his name, he replied, <laughs> I am here. <laughs> He was taken aside by one of the rescue workers to give a statement. Don't punish me too harshly, officer. My father will kill me, he reportedly told them. Now, what I love that you did not include, which they did include in this article, is how old this man was. He goes, my he's, father will kill me. He he's is not 50 17 years old. illegally drinking. He's 50. I just love, I just, this is, I just imagine him in like the search party and he's just like, he wandered and he's like, oh, I think I can help with this. Just trying to help. Love that. That's how, honestly, that's the energy we should all carry to everything. I think I, I agree. I agree. Um, okay. So I'm just, thank you. Thank you for reading that. I just thought that was just amazing. Well, it's important like, to update our listeners on news. On news. World news. From September 30th on the BBC. <laughs> We're very, very up to date. Can I confess something really quick? Yeah. So you just put something on your Instagram and I believe the caption was God answers prayers and your stories. Uh-huh. He does. Okay. I don't know who Big Time Rush is. Are you serious? Yeah. I know you got really excited. Is when... this like a bit? No, I, I don't know who they are. I know that you got really excited because they had a show or something. And one of our guests, Sinead, was on the I show. I guess because. Um, a Big Time Rush. Yes. The Big Time Rush. Big Time Rush. Um, Did you call them BTR? <gasps> yeah. They're before BTS. BTR comes before That's BTS. Funny. What is a big time rush is what I'm asking. First of all, all, big time rush was a TV show about a boy band. So the TV show surrounded a fictional boy band. They're monkeys. I don't know. Hey, hey, with the monkeys. I don't know. Your mom and my mom would know about it, but I think they were. My mom loved the monkeys. Okay. So they were like a fictional Beatles that then eventually became a band. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have been to many Big Time Rush concerts. First time I saw Big Time Rush was at, it was at a concert hosted by Michelle Obama. They did Nickelodeon. Yeah, Nickelodeon and Michelle Obama used to do this thing called Worldwide Day of Play, where they would go into a different city. Yes, I do remember that. And they wouldn't broadcast on Nickelodeon for that one day, but they were in DC one year and they, the, the big day was in DC one year. Actually, this is funny. We can post this picture. And I waited at that barrier for probably six hours. So I could be front row for big time rush. Were you? I I was my, my sweet mom was there with me and she just hung around in the back for a little while. Now here's a question. Do you meet friends while you're waiting six hours? Did you go with friends? No, I always went to that stuff by myself. Friends get in the way when you're trying to do that kind of stuff. (laughs) Um, do you like how do you feel about the fact that they got back together? Do you feel like maybe they, well, okay, they didn't get back together right with the world? No, they didn't get back together. Oh, okay. they I'm are so they sorry. did like a little reunion show in Chicago mm-hmm. and then they came out with new merch and they haven't made like an official statement on where they're at. But the other thing is, there's a little drama with one of the members. Tell me whether he's in or he's out. Oh, we don't we'll know. See where that, yeah, we don't know, Carlos. If Big Time Rush walked down the street right now, I would have no idea who they are. And yet I am so invested in what you just said. 
I'm just anyway. like, is Carlos in or out? We don't know. They were just a really good group, but they didn't have, they looked like a band that was put together for a TV show, if that makes sense. They had no chemistry with each other. Oh, and One Direction was put together, but they had chemistry until one of them left. We're not getting into that. That's, oh, I don't want to talk about that right now. Okay. I have things to do today. I don't know. Okay. Let's not talk about it. Yeah. Anyway. Well, BTR, BTR, BTW, (laughs) BTS. I think, oh, what I was going to say was, I think what what I shared on my Instagram story, they just came out with new merch, but the merch is really good. If you, any of you buy the big time rush merchandise, please send us a picture. Also, does anybody else not know who big time rush is or there's no way. Is There's anybody no else a huge BTR fan? I wouldn't say I'm a huge fan. I Call 1-555-3322. Anyway, Erin, we recorded our first live episode last week. We did. And it was so, so, so much fun. And I didn't say anything I regret. And that <laughs> was my biggest fear. I said a lot of things I don't regret, but that we will not be including. Yeah, no. I spilled a lot of tea. I it's dropped true. a lot of names and I shared stories that were just for the people that were there. And I'm sorry. A lot of Patreon secrets. A lot about of being ghosted. <laughs> about being ghosted by maybe a celebrity. Perhaps. I was ghosted by a guy in my 11th grade home economics class. So same thing. Did you guys use a sewing machine in home ec? No, our home ec class was like almost all cooking and random facts about doing taxes. <laughs> It was so fun. Claire was on. We talked about ghosting stories. It was just such a great time. So we're so excited about doing more of those. But you guys got locked in a bathroom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's great. We won't say who it is. You have to listen to the episode. It's a Figure Halloween it episode. It'll come out later this month. I'm really excited about it. It's going to be such a fun, such a fun episode. But you know yes. how much fun it was. How much? thinking. What? No, I was saying like, you know how much fun it was. It I know. I said how much fun. It was so fun. So you were thinking this is a bit. I thought we were, it's like a long. No, I missed it. Sorry. <laughs> Fine. Go ahead. What do you want to say? No, that was what I was saying. I was giving you like a, a lead in to talk about the thing. Well, you were leading me in. I was leading yes. you in. That's great. <laughs> it's we're going great. Well. we're so good. We should definitely be hosts of our own podcast. <laughs> Okay, guys, we're so excited to first let you know that we have no idea what we're doing. But second of all, to let you know that we have a new thing coming up. We are going to start doing live rom-com slumber party movie club. There it is. (laughs) So this was something we, we love the idea of doing, like, instead of specifically a happy hour with Patreon people, We wanted to do a slumber party and then we have gotten so much amazing feedback from our last rom-com episode. We were like, gosh, like this is something we could talk about forever. How much fun would it be if we picked a rom-com every one a month and did a slumber party movie club and sort of dissected and laughed about that rom-com? Also, when you just said forever, the immediate thing was Jesse full house going forever, forever. With all the candles. Remember they wanted it to, he was like a genie pants and he was going to be, yeah. and then he was like, no, this is how I want to do it with my sons playing with me. But first it was my wedding song to Rebecca. And one thing in Japan. Oh yeah. He was a huge star in Japan. Also, wasn't he like a crow or something or like a bat? I don't know. I kind of blocked out the later seasons. I see. When, when Stephanie got office. like rebellious, I was like, no, 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 this is not. Oh Stephanie. no. When Stephanie was smoking with a crayon. Anyway. Um, and do you want to announce what our first movie is going to be for the live, live rom-com slumber party movie club? It's about corporate sabotage in the publishing industry. (laughs) (laughs) Guys, we're watching a rom-com about corporate sabotage in the publishing industry. That's exactly what I just said. (laughs) I mean, there is corporate espionage in it. That's I what, think that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing, guys. I don't know if there's a better like representation of Crush the Podcast in and of itself. If 13, then like, then like a 13 year old who just wants to grow up faster and, and be like, popular mm-hmm. and just all the things. Have Jennifer boobs. Garner that she ah. doesn't she doesn't see the cute nice boy that's right in front of her because mm. he's too nice and he plays the keyboard. All right. Well, I am just so excited about this episode with Marcy. She is just such a delight. So funny and 
filled with wisdom and thoughtful. And we just had a silly time, but also like a super, super wonderful time and and very deep too. Marcy Alvis Walker. She is a writer and creator of the blog and Instagram feed Black Coffee with White Friends and Mockingbird History Lessons. She's passionate about what it means to embrace intersectionality, diversity, and inclusion in our daily lives. As a history enthusiast, she believes that learning our comprehensive history from diverse narratives is not only racially healing, but also radically anti-racist. She recently moved to Chicago, Illinois with her husband, daughter, and their dog, Evie, where she reads lots of books, watches a lot of movies, and drinks a lot of tea and coffee. And I can attest to that because her husband just brought <laughs> <a> coffee. <laughs> Thank you and welcome to Crush the Podcast. I'm so glad to be here. This is this is fun. This is fun. Uh, yeah. One of the things Aaron and I were just talking about is like, we really love to bring people on that that they get to tell their crush story that we don't have any preconceived notions. It's not our narrative. It's really like what they want to tell and what they want to talk about. And it's so fun to talk about your mash and like, you know, what did you want when you were a little girl? And it's just, I don't know. It's just really, we had a friend who she speaks a lot. She's sober. And she said, I'm always asked to speak about my sobriety. And I'm so excited. We didn't touch on that at all. Like she's Aww, like, I, I just got to be a whole person and tell you. What I want to so it is a very generous thing. It really is. It's a generous, generous offer to people. And I don't think people often, even just in our, our lives, like if there's this other thing, you don't get to talk about anything but that thing. Yeah. The new job or the job you lost, the divorce or the new marriage or the baby or, you know, the kids going off to school. So you don't get to talk about um, these deeper things. And yeah. I, I love this. Oh, good, yeah. good, cool. good. Okay. Well, to get real deep, this is our first question. I know. Our first, <laughs> really, really look inside yourself about this. Um, <laughs> what was your slumber party movie? So you're 12, you're having a slumber party with all of your friends. What was that movie? Oh, gosh. Okay. So I have to tell you, I hate to be like the orphan Annie of your show. <laughs> I, had a, I had a very traumatic childhood. So mm-hmm. I didn't have slumber parties. And mm because i didn't have slumber parties also because i had a birthday in in the summer which is the worst you just never have like that that school celebration where everyone knows it's your birthday and all of that stuff or a parent brings in like cupcakes or something like that so i never really had a slumber party Mm. but i will tell you (laughs) um i did have a little friend that lived across the street who often came over to, to spend the night and one night we were going to watch, um, this is when things came on TV and they only came on the one time. Oh, when you had to tune in right at eight. Oh, yeah. So I don't know. You youngins may not even <laughs> relate, but that's the way that them were oh, the yeah. way. So if you missed it, you missed it. But they were premiering Snoopy Come Home and um, <laughs> we were watching it. And it was a special thing because I was allowed to watch it. My grandparents raised us during the school year. Mm -hmm. So I was allowed to watch it in their bedroom on the good TV. Like it was a big deal. That's a big deal. So we were, I mean, the only other thing that we all gathered in there to watch is we had a family room and a TV room that had like a black and white TV. I know young ones, I just blew your mind, black and white television. (laughs) But um, We had the black and white television that lived in my parents' closet that if you had the stomach bug, you were allowed to bring it into your room. Yeah, yeah. Three channels, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. And the only other thing we watched in there before the whole world was woke was the Dukes of Hazzard. I am not kidding. (laughs) The whole family would gather on my grandparents' bed. We would watch the Dukes of Hazzard. When she came for this, we we were watching Snoopy come home. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen it, but super sad. And she and I were so overcome with grief that this little girl had, she couldn't even finish it. Her dad had to come and get her, walk her home. (laughs) Couldn't even finish it because we were so sad because Snoopy leaves Charlie Brown. And there's this sad song that they all sing. They're all going around the circle and they're just singing about this overwhelming sadness. <laughs> it's a super emotional movie and it deals with discrimination, 
like you know snoopy gets kicked out of the hospital because no dogs are allowed so it's like got this jim crow element going on <laughs> super intense for little kids right and so we were watching this movie and just heartbroken and she had to go home and i couldn't bear to finish it and that's like whenever i think of a, sl a slumber party or a sleepover and something that we watched i think of that movie yep that's well my that's a great way to start off <laughs> <laughs> to keep in the theme of nostalgia so when you were 12 ish it could be like you know middle yeah. school would yeah. you have wanted to live in a mansion apartment a shack or a house oh a mansion i was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt and without any reason whatsoever i, I wasn't <laughs> talented particularly i was convinced that i was going to be super wealthy so, much so i looked down on my older sisters and brothers and my parents like how come you guys have not achieved this yet what are you doing with your lives that you're not fabulously wealthy already <laughs> no that's my plan that's my game oh yeah mansion um wait really quickly did you ever like were you ever interested in those seminars where they're like get rich and like all anything like that no i wasn't there was no <laughs> i didn't i don't know if i just thought i'll just walk out into the world and they'll just start throwing money at me because i i had no like plan i didn't try <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> It's nothing I was trying to do. I just thought it was going to happen. You know, like That's really I funny. would look at, I remember watching um, 90210 oh, with yeah. my sister. And this was older than 12. I was in high school and my, um, and I was marveling over Kelly's hot mansion. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I just, oh, can you look at that? I, <laughs> just one day. And my sister was looking at me like baboons were coming out of my ears. She was looking at me like, girl you have no this is never gonna happen like and i remember thinking she's just not a believer i you know and with that attitude ma'am <laughs> it's not gonna happen for you you have to believe like i was like one of those people oh my gosh that's so great okay so and at that age what did you want to be when you grew up other than rich <laughs> i think that was pretty much it i really had no aspirations except to be pretty. I remember thinking, hearing what a Playboy bunny was, but not understanding what a Playboy bunny was and going, mm -hmm. oh, they hang out at a mansion and they wear a bunny costume? <laughs> that sounds good. So there was a moment in time around that time that I would have maybe said Playboy bunny. It, well, that was me with wanting to be a Hooters girl. And it was such a, no, <laughs> yes! it was such a testament to how innocent I was that I did not understand the way people were looking at them because to me, they were all such good friends and they looked like they were having so much fun and, yep. and people would come up and take pictures to them. It never occurred to me the like sexuality behind it all. Okay. Yeah, I'm with you. I thought the Hooters, Hooters was a pretty promising career too, <laughs> as well as being a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader that because I watched one. like they were on the Oprah show back in the day. And I just thought that could be fabulous. And it looks like they need a few more black girls. I remember thinking that. Absolutely. I, I started doing cheer because I wanted to be a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader because I, yeah. I watched the show and I loved the episodes where they were all such good friends. They would all go out yes. and help each other with the routines. <laughs> but think about like how much of that is like, I want to be seen. But a lot of it is just, I just want community. These look like good friends. Like, I yeah, know. they had good hair and good clothes <laughs> and makeup. And I, I was a kid that being the youngest of five and having um three older sisters who were much older than me mm -hmm. i think i was always wanting to be older and mm -hmm. like you know so anyone who wore makeup wore high heels for me i think i just wanted to be fully womanized mm -hmm. and to me all of that gear the house the hair the nails the makeup the nylons were all what I thought being a woman was. So I think right. growing up, my greatest desire was to be 10,000% woman. <laughs> 
woman <laughs> right without any understanding of what that meant yeah. <laughs> you know I remember reading Tina Fey's book and she talked about like quote unquote when I became a woman and she said yeah. she talked to so many women and it was when they got the male gaze and I remember thinking that's all I wanted because I watched men look at other girls and I just was oh, such yeah. a late bloomer nobody was looking at me and I remember going into a restaurant I think with my mom and my mom I was I don't remember. I was late teens, early 20s, maybe. And my mom said, wow. And I said, what? And she goes, I'm not getting that view anymore. And I haven't for a while, but now I'm watching men look at you. And I literally was like, who looked at me? Who? Where? <laughs> Where? Like, I'm sure she was like, oh, my poor desperate daughter. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Are you, is it you? Is it you? Hi, I'm Kirsten. How are you? Did you look at me? <laughs> Um, okay, so who did you want to marry when you were in middle school? Oh, that's easy, because I wanted to marry him in middle school and in high school and for my first year of college, and that was Keith Macon. Wait, I don't, oh. I'm going to have to. No, a... don't Google him. He's no one to Google. He was just a boy in school. <laughs> oh. <laughs> a boy from my church. I thought he was like and a celebrity. <laughs> no, it was Keith Macon. He had a dairy curl. He wore <sighs> eyeliner. He dressed like Prince, and that's all I needed in my life. That's did all. He have... Did he have a ruffle ascot? Oh yeah, he had like he he would do the whole Prince thing, and I I I just thought he was amazing. We have Keith on the phone. Keith, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's funny because I have looked him up. I cannot find him anywhere. I can find his sister, his brother. I cannot find him because I'm so curious. Because I'm just like Keith Macon what happened to that boy because he was like dating like a slew of girls and i was one of them and wait I'm you just like, wait 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 stop you dated him yeah he was oh, my first did... kiss <gasps> yeah you did not share that i thought this was an unrequited crush oh, oh no 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 he, he was my <laughs> first kiss i just thought for sure and it didn't matter like that he had like a million other girlfriends i was like in the end, it's going to be me, y'all. Don't you worry. Like on the back of the show, like one of those women like, like that goes off to the side and says to the camera, I know in the end that we have this connection. It's really me. And I know he's dating all these other girls. And he said that, you know, we have to keep it pretty, you know, cool and chill. But it's going to be me when he comes to I'm going to be the, like I was that girl. And you were there for the right reasons. Yeah, I was there for the right reasons. <laughs> Exactly. You were not there to become famous. You were just there for Keith no, and only Keith. I was there for Keith and only Keith. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And where were you going to live? Funny thing is that I took this, um, I don't know what kind of BS class this was, but <laughs> it was a class about family and marriage. I'm not kidding. That's what it was about. In school? I think it was called that even. And we had to write a life plan. And I okay. wrote basically this mash thing. I put like where we were going to live. I was going to be a lawyer at the time. Okay. Because I had to think of something legit because this was an assignment. Right. Couldn't and, get rich. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, who's rich? Lawyers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Keith was going to be working on his albums because he's going to be a recording artist. Naturally. And we were going to live probably down the street from wherever I live. <laughs> like, I, I, I had no real, like, I, I knew nothing of the world. So whatever the rich neighborhood was in my neighborhood, that's right. where we were going to live. That's, that that would be it. Love how so many of us as a child didn't really put all the, like, one girl was like, I want to live on a house on stilts, but I also want to be president and, like, in Washington. <laughs> like, it's just so cute, like, what we, we needed all this thing actually yeah. kind of didn't work you know like yeah, never made it. any sense yeah yeah we don't think anything like that we just, right you know yeah and i think it was very much if, we, if you're a kid of the 80s 90s and early 2000s it was very much whatever you wish or you dream you will you can become it because we had oprah and we had all these sort of like not self-help but just these self-actualization mm. um people who were leading us in self-actualization. So I think a lot of that comes from that. Like my mom didn't dream like that. And my mm -hmm. grandparents certainly didn't. What they dreamt of was marry a good boy with a pension plan. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? A boy who's going to work in a good company and, you know, buy a house. Very, very simple. And my sisters who were born in the 60s had that simple thing, too, mm -hmm. where they were just like, just meet a guy. I remember my sister was so happy because we celebrated because my sister had started dating a boy who worked for FedEx. And I was disappointed. I was like, dream higher, like, you know, but he worked for FedEx and my family was like, they have good benefits and oh, if this works out, you have made it. You would have thought that she was like from some Jane Austen book and we have made this perfect match with this, with the FedEx guy. <laughs> But that was the dream. Like no one was dreaming bigger than that in those generations, the Isn't, 60s. They really weren't. That is so interesting. We've talked a little bit about this on our show because exactly what you're saying, like generational, I feel like I've been unpacking the last 10 years, this kind of prosperity gospel. If you dream it, it will happen, all this kind of stuff, which I don't think is necessarily wrong I, or maybe right. like it's just almost like off a little bit it's right? off it's a, yeah. it's a bit skewed. Well, it's not the whole story yeah right we have jim and tammy faye baker and we had all these people and they were and people loved them like people yeah. forget and we, there was this element them. of god wants you to be rich god wants right. i remember what was the prayer of jabez that was like that was like oh, like, my, gosh, oh my yeah like, i remember make that. my make my like um whatever, bigger. I can't even remember yeah. the prayer, but it was like, yeah. my, and I remember praying, I was just about to move out to LA. I did too. I prayed that oh so hard. Oh my gosh. And then like, looking <laughs> back, I'm like, um, yeah, that's, that's not, that's not, that's not how that works. <laughs> I did it too. I did it too. I had a friend that got so mad at me. One of my best friends, we were, we, I was older. I'd been divorced by this time. So my reality had really shifted and my ideas about what was real and attainable in life and should be pursued in life had changed. And um, she was really mad at me because she had just read the secret. <laughs> and we had gone to brunch and I had said, I'd had this picture up on my wall and my one bedroom apartment where I turned the dining room into my room so my daughter could have the bedroom and we were mm. just, you know, it was the one crappy apartment in this really wealthy part of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So she could go to this one school that I wanted her to go to. But um, I remember hanging up this picture in the back of the country living magazines. They used to have these pictures of homes. Like I cut out this one cottage and hung it on my wall. And it was like this thing, I'm gonna wake up every day and. I'm gonna work so hard and I'm gonna be one of those single mom success stories. Like, you know, hey, I divorced that man, but look at me now, like one mm -hmm. of those stories. And um, one day I, I was having this, you know, just kind of time of prayer. And I was just like, I, I'm so okay that if I never leave this apartment, if this is it, I'm okay. I can be, I can be happy and joyous here because I'm at peace with myself, right? While that sounds really good, I'm sure that probably lasted maybe two weeks, y'all. But at the moment, it felt real and deep. And maybe it changed me entirely. But I did, I took the picture off the wall and I was telling my friend about it. And I thought she would do kind of like we, what you guys said. She'd lean in and go, hmm, you know, like give me that Oprah like, aha, like moment. And she goes, what? That crappy apartment? I, what? And she was like throwing all this secret stuff at me. Like, no, if you believe that, well, yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen. And, blah, blah, blah. and she was so upset with me all through brunch. All she could do is go, really? That, that apartment? You're just going to stay in that one bedroom crappy apartment? Like nothing more. You're fine with that. And I remember just thinking, yeah, but why are you so mad about it? Like, why are you so upset? What is I that? Think, what is yeah. that doing to you? Like, exactly, not her, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it just triggered her. So I think yeah. we were all on that plane. What you're saying is so powerful, and so much of what we talk about on the show is like this acceptance and the peace, the honesty of, of the pain of like I'm not where I want to be, but can I be peaceful and joyful? and here and also the honesty of it lasted two weeks and then I was struggling you know like I yeah. just had a moment yesterday where um and also I'm totally PMSing so I'm sure that exacerbated it <laughs> but I just had a moment yesterday where somebody I'm uh, acquaintance friends with 
um, won a really big award. And oh. I am happy for that person. And they're doing something that I eventually want to be doing, not exactly what they're doing, but it, mm -hmm. it was like this moment of like, I struggle a lot with, does God see me? And- Oh my gosh. Ooh. Yeah. Girl, and yes. I was so proud of myself for being like, this is where I'm at. I'm really hurting. I know this isn't the truth, but right now I feel like, God, you do not see me. You do not trust me. You don't think I'm good enough. Like all these things. And for me to like get that out within less than 24 hours, I feel so much better. And, you know, I can look at the world and know exactly like that. It, I just, I can, I, I don't feel that anymore. And it feels so good. Mm -hmm. I didn't shame myself, which is something, you know, I'm really working on and stuff. So that heard and felt every single word of that. I mean, I'm nodding over here. Cause I'm just like, yep. Mm -hmm, check, check, yeah, check. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Been there. Yeah. yeah. Probably will be there later. Yeah. Meet you there. I'll see y'all wait. Yeah. <laughs> Also, what I love about you saying, like, I was there and then two weeks later is it's like the permission to, I think sometimes when we, and we've talked about this a lot on the show, like when we cry again or when we're upset about, and it feels like, am I, am I a hamster just like running on the same wheel? Right. And it's like, also give, you know, my therapist has this prayer. I've said this before, like, give me the grace to see what you want me to see for me to have the God, give me the grace to like see that I have made progress and that I am doing really well. And also that that person's success, failure or whatever has nothing to do with me, but I can still acknowledge that I'm jealous and not pretend that I'm not and be like, I'm so happy for them because that's just going to build resentment. And just Oh like, yeah. Oh. Yeah. You have to be honest about it. And ah. one trick that I've been doing lately in that, because I struggle with that too. I totally struggle with it because what I do is so public. And mm -hmm. so, and, and it's hard not to be in touch with what others are doing, or mm. it's very hard not to be compared, especially in the realm of, of black activism in the church. And mm -hmm. so, because there's not that many out there, mm -hmm. but what I've really found very helpful is to count the people who I really want to be like who who aren't very noticed, you know, like mm -hmm. their work isn't like they're not even on social media. Like, like I'm a big fan of Richard Rohr and I'm a big fan of Barbara A. Holmes. And these mm -hmm. are people that just aren't doing that. Like, I'm not saying I could ever go live out on a desert place and just be Richard Rohr. It's never going to happen. Um, but then I also ask myself, well, am I any better than Audre Lorde or Octavia Butler, all these writers who wrote and their mm -hmm. work wasn't really appreciated until they were dead and gone. I mean, mm -hmm. am I any better than Van Gogh? <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. am I? You know, it's just kind of like just the realization that it may not happen ever in a big, massive way in this lifetime, in a way that the world will perceive as big. Not necessarily mm -hmm. that. Big for me is not really all that big if I'm being like truthful and honest and my best self. Like my best knowing is that big is being able to do what I do, sustain myself, support my family. You know what I mean? It's yeah. pretty simple. Yeah. But but um, success and big in the world is a spot on Oprah going on fresh air, you know, <laughs> for a yeah. writer. And I'm just like, well, I don't think Audre Lorde was ever on fresh air. I think it may not happen. And if it doesn't happen for all these people who are amazing, maybe that's not the goal. You know, just a really quick story because I know we need to move on. When I worked at Borders um, Books and Music, I worked at the biggest one in the, in the country. I worked at the one in Chicago. Okay. Um, yeah, kids, Google that too. Everything I know <laughs> is gone and dead and buried. Everything I know. I she's worked fine, at, guys. She's totally I'm fine. Fine. <laughs> fine. <laughs> I worked at Borders Books and Music, and I remember reading this book that I thought was so amazing, right? And like, no one was, it was not a bestseller. No one was reading it. I remember love falling in love with this poet and being in the, the room processing book and noticing that his memoir, his beautiful memoir that changed my life was on the remainder tables, like for two bucks. And it destroyed me. 
my perception of how books got sold. So then I started to do research and I didn't know it was a, it was it had nothing to do with the merit of the book. Like it, it really doesn't. And when I found out that it was like seeing the wizard behind the curtain, it just really made me realize that, oh my gosh, there's, this place is full of amazing books with amazing stories that will never make the New York Times bestseller. This author may never get picked as an Oprah book, but that doesn't mean that they aren't worthy. They're just, mm. they're just not, I don't know what happens. It just did, didn't happen that way for them. Mm. But certainly got nothing to do with merit. Mm. And that's been hard for me because, you know, we were raised with gold stars and it's very hard for us to understand that meritocracy really does not equal value because mm. we've been told that it does. Just gonna um, I, make sure that is a quote. That's the quote. You know, I, <laughs> I took a, a class at UCLA and it was on the science of celebrity. And it was basically this idea that we have turned the, t the term celebrity into something that means worthy. And it's like, no, the term yeah. celebrity means notoriety. So like, yes. it, it's so interesting to me when people are like, there shouldn't be social media stars at the Met Gala. And it's like, why? The Met Gala is a fundraising event. Yeah, like, exactly. it's not a, it's not some sort of um, dinner for people that are words. It's not an award eating. ceremony. It, no, it's, yeah. and even awards too are just yeah. whoever can get them the most press. And right. it's just like, it's just so interesting to me that people are like, she's famous for being famous. She doesn't deserve to be famous. Nobody deserves to be famous. Yeah. It's not something you're awarded. It's just a term right. that means enough people know you. you enough know? people know you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, so anyway, um, your, crush, <laughs> into it. your crush moment set the stage because I read it and I was like, oh my word, what is about to happen? Okay, I've had many, but this is probably the biggest one. So in this world of, you know, growing up with 90210 mentality um, and all these ideas about fame and value and merit, um, when you have a kid, you're just like, this person is the sun, the moon, the president, and also the ruler of any nation. This, 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 is, this is it. Y'all need to come here, pay attention, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was pretty m just love struck with my, with my kid. Like really, you know, like in the same way, I think many parents are, not all parents, because some people don't get the pleasure of having that. And when I got married, remarried and moved to Austin, part of that was because Austin offered this kind of suburban city life. So mm -hmm. you're in the city, but it's very suburban and, yeah. you know, it's very like E.T., you know, like the, the, the street I love. That's my favorite part of the movie is the yes, street yes. that they live on. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I had this kid who I just wanted everything for. And she had been bullied in the public school that she had gone to mm -hmm. for being smart. And I was like, we can't have that because then she's going to be like, it is so not worth it to be smart, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I didn't want her to think it wasn't worth it to to want to learn and to mm -hmm. know things. So we homeschooled for a year mm -hmm. and basically just read The Hobbit and didn't do much. <laughs> terrible <laughs> homeschooler. And um, to get her, you know, because I was so worried because everyone's like, what about her socialization? Like everyone kept saying that. And it's like, right. oh my God, no. So I set her up in the American Heritage Girls Club, which yes. every single word of that should have rang some bells. But it, I'm in Texas. What am I going to do? Right. So, um, and I noticed that where we met, this, this church where we met, all the girls that would be coming into the class, a, a, a good amount of them had this uniform, this private school uniform, and they just seemed free. These kids just seemed so dang free and full of light and just, mm. you know, and these moms just couldn't stop talking about this school that was part homeschool and part going to school. So it was a university model school, Christian Academy, classic edu classical education. Got it. All okay. those things should have been like, nope, 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 nope. But to me, I was like, ooh la la, that sounds like something that my fabulous, fabulous 
child should have. So we get her into school and it started out great. Like it started out everything that we dreamed it would be. Like she, she loved her teachers, but she came in in the sixth grade and we noticed that as she was progressing, a couple of things. I was the only black mom. She was the only black girl in her school at the time. Mm -hmm. I think there was one girl who was at a lower level and they didn't stay, they left. Okay. And then there were little kids who were like in the pre-K, but they were in white families, but no little girls, just okay. my daughter. And then another mixed race girl came later. Okay. Like she came later. Um, so my daughter was it. And we're in the school and I'm seeing that my daughter's kind of having a hard time staying connected or connecting and having friends like in a real way. Like she's invited to things, but she's invited to things because they're all invited to things. Like we're just noticing things, but she's right, happy. Right. And the, the education seems fine. And every now and again, they'd say something Christian creepy, but we just go, oh, we'll just, we'll just talk about that at home. We'll just say, that's okay. You know, like they would say can we please, can things. you please trademark that Christian Christian creepy. Because <laughs> that's that a perfect descriptor. Yes. Yeah. And, and everyone knows what I'm talking about. Just those little mm -hmm. creepy things that are Christianized and you're just kind of like, oh yeah. <laughs> I was connecting with moms. I had like some friends there for sure. But I wasn't like in with the moms. Like I wasn't like I knew that they would get together and go camping and, and I got that they didn't invite me camping. I, and I was glad that they didn't invite me camping. <laughs> so I was fine with that. But I also noticed that my husband being white and me being black, I think it really threw them off. And so while the moms felt good about it, I don't know how their husbands felt about us. I think once we were invited, once or twice we were invited to dinner. But like, you know, like I knew that other families were getting together for dinner and they were doing stuff together and they, you mm -hmm. know, but it wasn't that often for us that that mm -hmm. happened. But even still being an introvert, I wasn't all that concerned with it. I really didn't want to go to dinner, you know, sort of a, a thing. And I, and I don't think I knew, I, I don't think I was aware of the racial divide in a real way. I just was working to fit in and working to make sure my child fit in, in the way that many black people who are in white spaces do. Like, it's almost like you're, you're constantly code switching so much you don't even notice. Mm -hmm. You don't notice how much you're not really being yourself. You don't mm -hmm. notice it. And I have been raised in an all white school, so I really, really didn't notice. And so we were at a parent night. My husband and I were at parent night and um, they were talking about this. She was in ninth grade, beginning of ninth grade, and they were telling us ninth grade parents what to expect at the higher level, the rhetoric level, like what kinds of assignments they were going to be doing to get ready for their senior thesis that they were going to do and present eventually. And the head of the history department announced one of the assignments that they would do, and they all look forward to it, was this slave debate. And I was like, say, what now? Like, you know, because you're at these parent things, you're half there, you just want to be there enough that if the parent, if the teacher asks you something, you can respond. You're thinking about whatever you were looking at online that day. You're thinking about a million other things, right? And your, your husband probably doesn't listen to any of it, but, um, you know, it's just there. So um, I was kind of shook and I was like, I, I didn't hear that right. I, I honestly just automatically thought, there's no way I heard that right. I didn't hear that right. So when we walked out, I asked my husband, I was like, did you hear that thing about the slave debates? <laughs> like, and he was like, I heard it, but oh my gosh, you saying it, I hear it so much clearer. Like, you know, he's like, she can't do that. And then, God bless him, he's like, really right, she can't do it, right? <laughs> I'm like no she can't like i was like what are we gonna do so we i went home and i think i just cried and prayed and prayed and cried because i went online and looked up slave debates and i saw all these 
videos of kids doing slate debates. It was really sad and very alarming. And I did not know this was happening. What? Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. What are they doing? I've never heard of a slave debate. So what they do is it's a mock trial okay. and each kid takes time to present all the reasons that slavery was a good thing and all, all the pros for slavery. And then they switch it and they do all the cons for slavery. And so my daughter would have been the only black child listening to all of her white friends and classmates say all the reasons that slavery was good. Even, even if they're gonna talk about all the reasons it was bad, she has to get through just two days of that, right? However long it takes for them all to do this thing. Sorry, I wish oh, all of it, you could see. I, I wish my face I right could now. tell you that it was like it was 1932, but no, y'all, this was like 2015, 14, 15. <gasps> it was it was not long ago, you know. I was crushed, and I and it changed, and it really was the catalyst for Black Coffee White Friends. It was the because I had been writing for a long time, and then I didn't think I should write like publicly, like I, I, I didn't want, I wasn't really gonna do a blog or anything like that. But when this happened, I was just like, oh no, I need to start writing. I need to start publishing all these thoughts. i have been writing letters for my daughter and I, I wanted her to have all these thoughts because when my mom died, I didn't have her letters or her things that I had questions about. So, um, and kids don't, I, I know people think that black folks sit around and talk about race with their kids, but their teens, just like any other teen, they don't want to talk to you about race. They don't want to talk to you about dating. They, they just don't want to have these conversations with you. So I really wanted to make sure that she knew things without me having to like every day be like Dr. King in the, in the car ride, like giving her like my sermon, <laughs> you know, like I'm just giving her, I have a dream, like every time you know, that like we're going to school. like the old school mics that are like on the, the thing. The exactly, podium. exactly. So didn't want so, to be that. Okay, so, okay. Uh, I just, I'm the like, same. I have a million questions just, like running through my brain. I don't so when know. You, what's interesting is when you said, when you wrote in the thing, Slave Debates I, in my daughter's school, I was like, I feel like she's going to say people debating the pros and cons of slavery, but also her daughter is young. Like, how is that possible? I just, yeah. I can't believe, I mean, I can't, that's not true. I can believe. I just, I'm so sorry for so many reasons, but also like, how, how did you, did you pull her out? Did you? Well, this is the thing. It, it was a weird time. So I actually talked to the school Another thing that happens is I wasn't sure if she actually said that. So I, I actually emailed her and said, listen, <laughs> so it like took me a couple of days. Like I had to collect myself and I was just like, I think you said that this is the assignment. And if that's what you said, my daughter cannot do this assignment. And she wrote back and I, I saved the letter. I like I saved our email exchange and she was basically like, Oh no 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 no! It, it is a slave debate, but but it's so that the kids the, the kids usually end up understanding how wrong slavery was in the end. And usually? I think we should sit down exactly. <laughs> we should sit down and talk with the head of the school. And we I think it would be better if we just sat down and talked. And I was like, great, we'll be there. And so when we sat down with her she starts telling me about how she grew up she's a little older than me how she grew up in selma alabama which is a hotbed of civil rights um action and how she grew up in a very racist family and how she had done all this work she had felt to undo her racism because she didn't want to be like that because of god right and it was sincere but I look back on that conversation a lot over the years. And at the time, I didn't even know half the things that I know. Like, I didn't know a lot about implicit and explicit bias. I didn't know about fragility. I didn't know. There's a lot that I didn't know. So at the time, what I said to her was, I, I get that, but they can't do this assignment. <laughs> and, um, and the guy who was the head of the school was 
had adopted a child who was black, like a, a little black boy. And I was and so he had this vested interest, but I don't think they understood. I don't think they got it. My thing is, it's not it should never be about God. God shouldn't be the marker for you to be good to humans. I'm like, I'm like, OK, but if it takes some sort of Christian duty for you to decide I'm not going to be racist, I'm not so secure in that because it could just as easily be so there are plenty of people who feel it's a Christian duty to be racist. So if that's your but if it's not like this inside thing where you're just like, this is just wrong. Um, not a good way to make every student in my classroom feel safe. And that's why I don't want to do it. it. It was just very awkward. And so we stayed at the school. We tried to work out some things with them on diversity and they seemed like they were excited to do it. But then I realized, oh, we're still just meeting all the time about this and nothing's really changing. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, to this day, the school still is meeting about the things that they're going to do. But I don't know how much they've actually done. But I was doing all this work, like writing reports and suggestions and researching and giving it to them and having these meetings and trying to show up and do all this stuff. But I honestly felt like I can't change people's hearts, right? I thought I was the only black mom at this school, <laughs> y'all, because kind of like my family hadn't worked to be rich yet. I was like, because other families just haven't gotten in on the deal yet. They just don't, like it didn't occur to me that there were systems in place that made it so mm. that I was the only black mom because I lived in a part of town where there were no black people. Mm. And that's a whole history there. So like all the history that led to that moment, I had no full understanding of. And then once I had that full understanding um, and tried to bring it to the school, it was received enthusiastically when it was face to face. But outside of that, it just didn't seem like it was, right? Right. And so what ended up happening is we were building this new school and it was going to be this fancy school. Um, they bought all this land and we were all like chipping in. I mean, we were chipping in nickels because we weren't one of the wealthy families. So a friend who had left that school because they moved away mm -hmm. said this really important thing that I, I hadn't realized. She said, you know what, when you invest in a private school, you're investing in the founder's idea and their vision. And I and something about her saying that was just like, yeah, the, their idea and their vision is not me and my child. And they proved it when they put out this kind of, I called it a manifesto, but it was this like um, statement of faith that they were saying that all the parents were going to have to sign. It was like five pages long, with all these Bible verses and it was things like, we're against abortion. We're against premarital sex. We believe that um, sex is between a man and a woman. It was all this like very anti-humanity um, stuff to me. And so my husband and I went and met about that. And my daughter was freaking out because she didn't want to have to start over again, even though she was not happy there. Mm -hmm. She's just like, gosh, what if I go someplace else and I'm just as miserable? Mm -hmm. That sounds terrible. I know what I'm up against here. I'll just stay with what I'm up against, right? Yeah. And um, as far as we knew, she hadn't had any racist encounters because she hadn't shared those with us. I had asked her, but she would always say, no, things are fine. And it was because... She told me, because I didn't want you to come to the school and burn it down. I just didn't, I knew you would lose your mind. And I, I did not want that, you know, and wow. she was not wrong. So, and they read this manifesto to the kids, the high school kids before they gave it to parents. And so Nadia sat there and then they like tacked on this weird thing where they used like something from Revelations to say, they didn't, I, they didn't stately say, definitively we are against discrimination racism sexism they didn't say that they said some they took some scripture out of context and they said um we believe that it'll be every tribe every i'm like you know the tribes are just one people jewish people those are those tribes we're you're using tribe as if that includes black people that, that you're taking this scripture that's very narrow and you're 
expanding on it mm. and trying to make it like your declarative statement on race. And After you were so explicit enough. about everything else. Explicit, explicit. And then I asked, well, what about the kids who are prideful and arrogant? You know, because God has a lot to say about that too. <laughs> and what about the kids who cheat? What about ones who lie? You know? And um, what did they say to that? Nothing. You know, it was it was a really weird conversation, and it was sad because we really liked this person. It wasn't, and and I'm glad for that because what it's taught me, even when I post things on Black Coffee White Friends, I know that the things that I post about the white church or the things that I post about the hypocrisy in the church or extreme conservatism, I know those people, and they don't they don't have horns. That's that's the thing. They're 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 believing things wholeheartedly, as wholeheartedly as I believe in my right to breathe. They are believing wholeheartedly in the right of someone else not to. You know, it's not this menacing thing that people seem to think that it is. Now there is there are menacing leaders out there that are just evil as heck. But um, I'm just saying that the average person who's attending church and dutiful and you know um just raised in this country isn't voting because they don't like black babies now they are voting because they're afraid of black men perhaps but you know it's it's just not as cut it's very nuanced and so it's helped me with that it's helped me to see the humanity in my enemies right so we did eventually take her out to answer okay. your question Okay. Um, and she went to a, and we were warned and people were just like, oh my gosh, you can't put her in a, in a public school, you know, she'll, and she was told things from other students of, oh my gosh, you're gonna, you're gonna have drugs and you're gonna do this and you're gonna, and the weird thing is like, she knew kids that did drugs at that school. She already knew kids in this Christian school who were having sex. She knew kids who were gay at that school, like all the things that they were fearful of. There might be all these other things, but so like there that's life. I'm I'm in awe of you talking about the com I wasn't compassion or maybe you said compassion here. The humanity humanity, humanity yeah. the humanity of your enemy. And seeing yes, there are people that are nefarious, but for the most part, people really do believe they're doing the right thing. And right. that's been something for me that's been really eye-opening in the last year and a half because I give so much grace to certain people and other people I have such a hard time giving grace to and it's yeah and it's the people that know God I have I don't want I I'm like you should what <laughs> and, and and I'm like yeah and I just I'm going to mess this quote up, but it's a quote from Dorothy Day. And she says, basically, as I've gotten older, what I've realized is I can't change anybody. All I can do is change myself. It's, which it's is so true. It's so true. And, you know, the other thing about it is that um, I get it. I, I totally get when we were in, in Texas, we lived this very privileged life. Like Texas as a whole, I don't care how poor you are or how wealthy you are. It's a it's a very privileged state in the sense of and people think this is stupid but i'm like your grocery stores are the size of football fields you can park anywhere like you know there's parking like there, there's just the grind that the rest like a like say living in chicago has mm -hmm. just doesn't even occur in mm -hmm. in texas there's no grind in that sense mm -hmm. right being a christian in texas is not a shocker. Like in, in Chicago, when I would go out with my friends and I would say that I was a Christian, they'd fall off the bar stool. You know, like, it's just like, no, you're not, you know, <laughs> like, but it's so common there. Like there's churches everywhere there. Like, it, and, and, and the Bible is very liberally sprinkled on everything, even in schools and in, places that shouldn't be like it's just so everywhere like it, it, it's just so clearly a bible belt right mm. you know you know the faith that's there right mm -hmm. 
And so then when you move to, like, we live in this part of town now in Chicago that's got a, a mosque, several churches, but there, it's a Unitarian church and a this church and a that church and a that kind of church and a that kind of church. And then there's um, the temple. So, you know, the Jewish temple, there's a Buddhist temple, there's spirituality around us, but it's, it's, it's very diverse, right? If you are privileged to only have to see what you understand, I guess mm. that's what it is that I'm saying about te Texas. You only have to see what you understand. When you suddenly to have that taken away or threatened, I get that would make someone scared and crazy. I understand that. I don't have a lot of patience with it or a lot of time for it, but that doesn't mean I don't understand it. So for yeah. me, my crushed moment really in that was um, recognizing that the world was not equal or equitable. And I always thought that it was. I really did. I believed that if a person just worked hard enough, they could be, live, do, go anywhere and be safe. And then in 2015, that same year that my, I learned about the slave debates, yeah, the beginning yeah. of a lot of things kicking off. Mm -hmm. And I realized, because we were seeing it, and if you lived in a community where you didn't hear about shootings, you wouldn't have. Like, mm -hmm. you know, but we had cell phones and it changed the game. And so, you know, it was really this moment where for a while I was really depressed about it. Mm -hmm crushed, depressed, just crushed. Because I wanna believe that the world is safe and gentle and kind and everyone gets to be, you know, I like, I want a God who's very much like Oprah and a little bit like Mary Poppins, like it's magic and everyone gets a car, you know? Like I want that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, like you were saying, I do have these moments where I'm like, God, do you see do you see? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's it, it, it's been a journey to learn that. I think that God's really saying, oh, I see clearly, but do you see? Do you see? And mm. do they see? Yeah. And you know what I think is hard too is acknowledging because you're like, you're, you're sort of asking God, do you see me? And y you know the answer is yes, but then you're like, but then how can you also see this person? Oh my gosh, yes, yes. Yes. And then with that, I remember my, my sister-in-law, I, she, she was having um, some trouble with a, a friend of hers and she was all put out by it. And then she had said to me, and I was ready because I'm the kind of friend, like you, you don't like them and you pissed at them. I, I'm ready to take them down. Right. We were talking on the phone and she had said to me, you know, but I had this moment where I was just like, when haven't I been just like her? Mm. And I was just like, and that's not always true. Also, yeah, like how I think the rain falls on both of us and the sun shines on both of us, on all of us. So I, I, and I hate that. I really do. I, and that's why I'm not God because <laughs> um, it would look a lot different and probably really messed up if I were. But to me, it's just like, no, I want them to like walk around and be miserable and I want them to go home and be miserable and I want them to be poor and I want them to be hungry and struggle and I want to be like eating my bread and they ask me for a crumb and I'll be like, no, because you're awful. <laughs> but that's just not the way it, it goes. And if anything, it's usually the opposite. It's usually the person that I most want to give bread to that isn't getting a single crumb. That's usually mm. the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Being a foster mother and an adoptive mother, they talk a lot yeah. about the language that used to be, let's say, mm -hmm. and I think parents still don't understand, but the language that used to be was like, this was meant to be, right? Like this, this child was meant to be. And you're like, no, yeah. that's actually negating a huge part of who they right. are and their, their first family. This wasn't meant to be. We live in a broken world. It is lost. And, and so there's, there's, there's fruit and beauty that can come out of hard things, but that never stops them from being hard. And I think what's so beautiful about what happened in this crush moment for you is what the fruit that came out of it. I'm so sorry that you had to go through this. Well, number one, I'm so sorry this is the way the world works. 
it sucks. Mm-hmm. It's not fair. And I hate it. And I hate it so much. <laughs> um, I want to punch it sometimes. Just the world. I just want to take the globe and just punch it. <laughs> Maybe just certain parts of the globe. Um, but at the same point, what I think is so beautiful is the fruit that has come out of this, which sure. has continued to grow and, and heartbreakingly so because of George Floyd and because of the where our nation yeah. is right now. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. I, I remember you posted something a while back I, in it was something to the fact of like, I'm humble to know where these followers came from kind of a thing. Um, oh yeah, every yeah. every single day I think about that. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a heartache because I'm like, I know that part of this big number and mm. it's modest in, in, the, in, the, in the celebrity realm of numbers, but for someone who's not published a book or, or mm. done anything but post and have a blog, um, it's it's a pretty big number and so when i think of it and how it got there Mm. it's always a reminder of oh a lot of this came on black death Mm. a lot of these followers are here because someone died and i hate that that's the reason Mm. and it's not because i hate the reason that people are following me or you know i just hate that someone had to die to to earn that attention and so yeah, it's it's heartbreaking. I remember J yeah. J Lo talked about that. She was like, "You know my name because of Selena." Like Selena's yeah. death created my opportunity for this film, but you know my name because of the tragedy. And I know that's yeah. not anywhere near the same, but Yeah, but it, but it is. Yeah. I get the, it. I get it. Yeah, that like in our crushed moments, whether they're a boy didn't like me back or we're dealing with racism in a world in a country especially that's been dealing with it since day one mm-hmm. um just these losses are just they're so profound and they are and they're just as you know and it's funny because i have a million boys that didn't like me back you know like i wouldn't say a million but it feels like a million mm-hmm. you know like the one feels like a thousand you know mm-hmm. and um and i feel like in some ways, America is the country that doesn't love me back. Like I, I'm, I'm in love with this country, but I feel like it's just the country who just wants the blonde girl or the, you know, the blue-eyed girl, the skinny girl. Like it doesn't want me. And so, what do you do with that? You know, I, I, that's why I relate so much to the Bible story with Leah. I'm like, you know, I feel like there's so many of us who are Leahs in this world like the world just doesn't want us we we're the we're the sister that that wasn't picked you know and it's a rare thing to be picked in this world and i don't think we realize that so many people never get picked and i it's one of those things that man i i can sit a long time and just be sad about that my family just be like you okay you know there's so there's so many people who aren't picked they just don't get picked you know like it crushes my soul yeah but On the bright side of that, I'm glad to live in a world that now is allowing people to pick themselves because it used to not even be an option. Like you didn't get picked and therefore that was it. That that was the end of you. But I think what also is so beautiful about that is that we're learning how to be whole people. Yeah. So then if marriage does find us or we do find marriage, it's two whole it's two whole people creating another like a new whole instead of please pick me, which was, I struggled with, please pick me because I'm so broken and so wounded that if you pick me, then I'll finally prove whatever it was. It wasn't just marriage. Yeah. It was the business yeah. and all this stuff. If Then it yeah. finally proves to everybody else, but mostly to myself that I'm worthy. Right. Right. This exactly. goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning. And I mean, you, what you just said about, um, boy, it just hit me so hard. What you just said about boys, not wanting you back, but then this country doesn't want you back. And I mean, that's the, it's so important for people that may not understand that they, that can be in almost like a language they can understand. And then that piercing of a heart. My hope is that this whole crushed is just piercing hearts for others so that Mm. we can see the humanity in others and that we can love others because Mm. we can find commonality in every story, even though every story isn't our story. Yeah, that's so true. It's true. I just, I feel so honored that I know we still have two more 
sweet questions, but I just feel so honored that, um, yeah, that you shared your story and, and I hope that, you know, you, that we were safe and that this will be it. I just, I'm Oh, honored. I feel entirely safe with y'all. How can you not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, I think that kind of leads us into, unless Kirsten, did you have something you wanted to add? No, I'm just in awe. Um, I'm just crying over here. Everything's <laughs> fine. So typically it would be if you could ask your 12 year old self. Something that I think about with these 12 year olds now um, who are black 12 year old little girls is it will blow me away to hear Black Lives Matter. I was in an all white school. That would have been a radical thing to hear. And I probably would have rejected it because I was told so often that it didn't. But I would have longed to have heard that and to have someone who would sit with me and help me to understand that at 12, which means, means that I probably wouldn't have sought that school um, for my daughter later in life. Our last question, what was your crush song when you were 12? I think I was a little older. I think I was 13, 14 when Careless Whisper came out. And that was like the song that Keith Macon and I danced to at my oh. homecoming. <laughs> and Keith, I, where are you with your ass? Keith, Keith, where are you? <laughs> where are you, man? I want to know where you are with your paisley jackets and <laughs> your, your eyeliner and your jerry curl. Like, what happened to you? So curious. I know I've said it like 50 million times and I'm going to say it 50 million more. And when we record the intro, I'm sure I'm going to gush about you. But I just, I really... I, this was so special and just thank you. It was very special for me. You guys have this beautiful thing. It's really beautiful. Yeah. I can't express it enough. I've, I've, I'm not like someone who's been interviewed regularly, but I have had a handful of interviews and this has been just oh, so fun and so warm and inviting and it's just been very good. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Well, um, I just hope you have a phenomenal day. <laughs>